Welcome back to the Band-Aid Man OC, your source for EMT education. I'm your man, Eric Johnson. Today we're going over Chapter 29, which is going to be covering trauma to the head, neck, and spine. If you are in my class, go ahead and follow along with the PowerPoint found in our Google Classroom. And if you're just jumping in and trying to learn a little bit more about EMT, go ahead and follow along with what is in the screen and go ahead and make sure that you take lots of notes. We are gonna be doing a very brief review at the end, as well as posing a question to all of you to try to test your knowledge. Without much further ado, let's get started. With the trauma to the head, neck, and spine chapter in most EMT textbooks, typically what we're gonna be talking about is the consensus that high, high velocity or uh, high energy trauma typically will lead to damage to the head, neck, and spine, or we will have a very high suspicion of that. Now, before we can get much further than that, we do want to do a quick review of the nervous and skeletal systems and talk about specific injuries. But remember this general concept that if you have a high velocity injury, or if you have an injury that was as a result of a high, uh, high energy mechanism, then we're probably going to err on the side of caution and at the very least apply a cervical collar, if not more, to help the patient not move as much. And we also want to uh, try to minimize as much internal uh, damage by reducing the amount of movement that the patient will do. We can still move them. They are still mobile for our purposes, but the more that we can reduce the amount of movement that they do, the more we can reduce the possibility of further injury to areas that we simply can't see. So, like I said, we're going to be doing a quick review. If you've been in an EMT class, a lot of this will be pretty basic, pretty straightforward. If you have not been in an EMT class, I would highly recommend doing a review of some of the anatomy and physiology that we're talking about today and there are some great resources that we'll go ahead and link in the comments below our nervous system is the thinking aspect of our body it is what allows our body to do all of the things consciously and subconsciously so that we're able to live our normal lives it controls things like thought sensation motor function um, it also tells us when we're hurt by sending pain signals, and it can also tell us uh, if something is incorrect or wrong, not necessarily through pain, but by a sensation that we don't normally feel. Uh, like someone that's about to have a seizure will often, not always, but will often have the sensation that something weird is about to happen, whether it be a narrowing of their vision or a, uh, a ring around their, you know, their, their, their line of sight, or maybe a specific taste or smell, metallic taste or metallic smell. What the nervous system does is it acts as a preemptive system to tell us when things are wrong, when things are about to be wrong, and generally if things are getting better. Typically, you find that if the patient is experiencing less pain, there is less injury that's occurring, whereas the patient that is experiencing more pain, typically, not always, but typically, is experiencing a much more severe injury. So these nervous systems are broken down into two main groups, and that is our central nervous system, or CNS, and our peripheral nervous system, or PNS. The CNS is very basic in not function, but in organ set. The central nervous system is located with regards to our anatomy in the brain and in the spinal cord. So this is the information superhighway as it starts and ends throughout the body. This is where everything will congregate and then be disseminated from. The peripheral nervous system are those organs and those body systems that allow the central nervous system to send out all of its uh, all of its information. So the best way to think of this is that the central nervous system is a freeway, an interstate highway, as it were. These are the major highways or uh, freeways, whatever you'd like to call them, that uh, interconnect all of our states here in the U.S. The peripheral nervous system would be smaller roadways that connect these highways to towns and cities all over. 
The peripheral nervous system is made up of the vertebral nerves, the cranial nerves, and then the body's motor and sensory nerves. And again, this is a very basic overview. So if you feel like you are just jumping on this train, go ahead and check out some of the great videos here on YouTube about the anatomy and physiology that makes up the nervous system. This diagram does a pretty good job of breaking down those two different uh, nervous systems. The central nervous system is outlined in red, and you can see that it's a very basic form function of the brain and the spinal cord uh, originating up in the brain and then going all the way down through the, uh, through the extent of the spinal cord. And then you have the peripheral nervous system that innervates or nerves that are uh, inter integrated throughout the body that go everywhere else. So as you can see, the central and peripheral nervous system are working together, but they are vastly different in the way that they innervate and assist with our body understanding what is going on around. It. The head itself is what is going to be protecting the computer. The one big thing, I mean, shoot, it's almost uh, reductive to say anything besides the brain. That is what is protecting our brain. The cranium is made up of different bony structures that fuse after birth. And we have different bony structures that make up the structure of our face. We have the mandible, the maxillae, the nasal bones, the zygomatic or malar bones, and then the orbits. And those are the bones that create the structure of our face. The spinal cord, however, is not a, obviously a bone, and it is not associated with any bony structure, any one bony structure, but what does do the majority of protection for the spinal column are the vertebrae. The spinal cord exits from the brain through the uh, foramen magnum, the opening at the base of the skull, and then goes all the way down our vertebral column as a, again, a super highway for the rest of the nerves throughout the body. Now, the spinal cord itself is a very fragile, a relatively fragile aspect of our anatomy. The spinal cord can be damaged by uh, direct force, uh, any type of direct force that's exerted upon it, but it can also be disrupted and, um, and injured through indirect force. For example, an individual that is exposed to explosive forces may find that there is some spinal involvement. It may not, uh, it may not sever the spinal cord or anything like that, but shock waves like that can cause there to be undue swelling. And swelling in the spinal column is obviously bad, just like swelling inside of our cranium with our brain is bad because there's very little room for it to expand and then contract. When we see that there's some type of swelling or damage to the spinal cord, we start to see that there are issues with a very special fluid known as cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. CSF is very, very integral to understanding the extent of damage, especially in patients that are dealing with a traumatic complaint. But CSF is a valuable diagnostic tool because anytime that there is issue with any of the cerebral spinal fluid, we will see that there are body and organ system wide issues throughout. So in individual patients that are suffering from meningitis or some other type of viral or bacterial infection will often see that there are trace markers in the cerebral spinal fluid. It's very easy to see that. And we are able to assess that through a procedure known as a spinal tap. When we're dealing with trauma, we may see that the trauma is so severe that the cerebral spinal fluid is being pushed out of different orifices, which is the fancy way of saying, orifice, the plural, uh, I believe it's orify, but I'm going to go with orifice because that sounds medically uh, relevant and it makes me sound like a really smart person. Not really, but let's get back to it. CSF, when found outside of the body, is usually an indicator that there's a big problem inside and specifically with the brain or with the spinal column. Cerebral spinal fluid is a mostly clear, it has a bit of a, uh, a bit of an off-white tinge and when we see it outside of the body, we can differentiate it from anything else because of the off-white color. Also, note that cerebral spinal fluid will separate from blood. Now, we have a very specific test known as the HALO test, where we are able to check for a, uh, a differentiation between the two fluids. 
if we were to see that there was blood or a clear fluid leaking from the ears, eyes, or nose, we would definitely want to try to capture some of that on a, uh, on a sterile dressing. Because what will happen if we do that, we'll start to see that the cerebrospinal fluid will separate from the blood. And that would be a positive finding. It would be negative for our patient, <laughs> but it would definitely be a positive finding and would tell us the trauma that was exerted on this patient was significant and severe. And what we're most likely seeing is either some type of pressure that is pushing the CSF or cerebral spinal fluid out, or that there is some type of puncture or opening into that space, whether it be the brain or the spinal, col the, uh, spinal cord itself. Now you can see here in this diagram, the anatomy of the head. This is nothing new. Most people have already seen this in their, um, in their anatomy classes. And so I'm not going to spend too much time going over this, but this is a great opportunity for you to go ahead and uh, look at the way that the head is broken up. And I do want to take a quick, a quick moment to note the different aspects of the skull. If you look, you can see that there are almost border-like separations on the different components of the skull. What those are are markers of where the skull fused together after birth and as the patient got older and older. The reason for this is to allow for the passage of, uh, of, of newborns through the birth canal so that they are able to be compressed very, very slightly and for a very short period of time and then expand and then form up. Moving forward, the anatomy of the spine. This is probably one of the most important aspects of any type of trauma assessment. Now, no one as an EMT would ever be expected to be able to count every single uh, lumbar section necessarily, but it is good to know that we have a very specific number of these vertebral, uh, of these vertebrae or vertebral bones that are located in the spine. There's nothing that's really clever or, uh, or cute to help us remember these numbers, so it's best to just understand that these numbers do exist. The numbers are 7, 12, 5, 5, and 4, and those are what make up the different aspects of the vertebrae. The first and by far most important for us in EMS will be the cervical spine. The reason that this is so important is because it protects some of the most integral parts of the spinal cord and what it controls. I know that a lot of uh, people out there have heard this, and I know for a fact that all of my EMT students have heard this, but the old phrase of C or cervical, three, four, and five, keep the diaphragm alive, is important to understand because what they're saying is that particular aspect of the spinal column is in charge of the expansion and contraction of the diaphragm. With those being in that position, it makes sense why we're so aggressive about cervical stabilization and cervical immobilization. Moving down, we have our thoracic spine, and the thoracic spine starts just at about the shoulder level and then goes down to about the mid-back. This is made up of 12 vertebrae, and we'll see that uh, most of the injuries in this area will, be, uh, will result in, um, obviously, pain, but if we have any kind of uh, issues with loss of motor function, we'll typically see that it's lower than the... Uh, than the part of the spine that is actually broken. And we'll also see that there is a large number of patients that will have a very difficult time, if not an impossibility, to move parts of their upper body, not necessarily because of spinal involvement, but just because of pain, generalized pain. Lower than that, we have our lumbar spine. This is most commonly found in injuries that are long-term or they have a uh, long-term onset. These are more chronic injuries, and we'll typically see this in individuals that have some type of uh, some type of background in heavy lifting. We hear this a lot from individuals that also sit for long periods of time, uh, like truckers or office workers, where they'll have lumbar pain, and this is where the concept of lumbar support comes from. Lumbar support being pressure that's exerted on the lumbar section to alleviate some of that pain. Then below that, we get into the aspect of the vertebrae that are really difficult, if not impossible, for us as EMTs and paramedics and pre-hospital providers to really do much with. It's the sacral and the cossex. The sacral and cossex aspects of the spine are typically unable to be effectively palpated just because of their anatomic location. 
and they're very difficult for us to go ahead and assess because they are fused. Um, they are not individual vertebrae as we would find in the lumbar, thoracic, and cervical uh, components of the spine. Also, sacral and coccyx injuries are nearly impossible for us to effectively immobilize until we immobilize the entirety of the back. So these vertebrae are found in every human. They all are going to present differently because of anatomic abnormalities as well as simple uh, anatomic development. But understand that the vertebrae are mostly found in this uh, 712 554 um, breakdown for a total of 33. Moving forward. This is the anatomy of the spine, as you can see here. And I'll let you guys go ahead and review this on your own so that we don't waste too much of your time. Now, we're moving forward into injuries of the skull and the brain. And injuries to the skull and brain are probably going to be the ones that bring up the most obvious signs and symptoms. They're certainly not going to be hidden as much as we would see with injuries to the vertebrae and to the neck and back. So let's jump right in. The injuries to the skull and brain that we'll start with are scalp and skull injuries. Scalp and skull injuries tend to have a couple of uh, pretty, pretty standard common aspects. And those common aspects would be a lot of blood loss, a pretty significant amount of blood loss, especially when you consider the, uh, the size of the wound. The reason why our faces and our heads are extremely vascular. We have a lot of blood vessels that run through the, uh, the head and the face and everything there. So it's very common to see someone that appears to be bleeding profusely from what is quite, quite obviously a very small injury. Now that doesn't mean that the blood loss is not important to note. You can lose a significant amount of blood through a small or relatively small injury to the face or scalp or head overall. But it does stand to note that if we understand that we're anticipating a large amount of blood loss, we can at the very least try to reassure our patient, you know, face and head wounds tend to bleed a lot. We're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look to see exactly where, where you're hurt. And, uh, you know, for the most part, we can pretty much assure them that the wound will be much smaller than they actually anticipate. Now, that's certainly not a uh, black and white statement. You need to be very careful about what you do say to your patient, but patient reassurance is absolutely part of your treatment modalities, and you should definitely focus on preparing to reassure your patient on a regular basis. Now, scalp and skull injuries definitely need to fall into the terms that we've already discussed, whether the patient is experiencing an open or a closed injury, but there is a vast difference in the way that we'll go ahead and treat these. So let's talk. So what we're looking at here is an injury to the scalp and specifically we're looking at an open wound. You can see that the patient has uh, taken some type of traumatic blow to the head or possibly fallen and we can see that this has gone through all three layers of the skin. It is hard for us to tell if there's any kind of involvement of the cranium of the bony structures below, but what we could do is we could begin our assessment with palpation. We can also assume that because of the force that was exerted on the head here, it would probably be appropriate for us to go ahead and put the patient in uh, manual cervical stabilization. We wanna do manual C-spine here. And the reason why we want to integrate manual C-spine is because force that would cause this would most likely have some type of compressing action against the vertebrae. And if we have some type of some type of swelling in the brain or the spinal column, that can certainly cause there to be other injuries that are not locally uh, addressed. So we definitely want to put this patient in manual C-spine, place them in a C-collar at the very least, and possibly consider further immobilization. And then we need to follow through with all of our other work, such as bleeding control, uh, our normal patient assessment, and then a head to toe. So these brain injuries that we're going to be talking about can be put into two different categories. We have direct injuries and indirect injuries. A direct injury to the brain is much less common than an indirect injury, but a direct injury is where the brain has been lacerated, punctured, or bruised by broken bones from a foreign object or bruised 
by, uh, by the broken bones themselves. Direct injuries to the brain are much less common because of the amount of force that re that's required to break the cranium and to cause that injury to occur. What is much more common, and we see this on an everyday basis with sports, are indirect injuries where shock of impact is transferred to the brain and then we have residual swelling. It could be as a result of the brain basically bouncing around or as a result of the brain swelling or uh, even further, the brain being compressed because of blood that is building up in that cranium. Now, for the purpose of traumatic brain injuries, we do need to follow through with a little bit of clarification between a concussion and a contusion. A concussion is anything that will cause there to be swelling of the brain. And that's very specific. Swelling of the brain is considered a concussion. Contusion, if you'll go back to some of our other chapters talking about the difference between a contusion and a hematoma, a contusion is any time that there is blood that is building up in that space. Now, you need to understand something. The brain and the cranium act in a way to basically suspend the brain in fluid. That fluid is not just blood. It is cerebrospinal fluid. And the cerebral spinal fluid and blood, as we said before, do not mix very well. When we have bleeding that's occurring in the brain, it can cause there to be pressure that builds up against the brain and causes there to be dysfunction as a result. Also remember that that bleeding that's occurring will eventually clot and can cause there to be additional damage that's exerted against the brain. On the other hand, we have our concussion where the brain itself is swelling due to either direct or indirect forces. The concussion versus contusion argument really is very basic. It's, it's really almost just a question of semantics, but at the same time, it really isn't a question of semantics. However, what I can say definitively is that a concussion or a contusion, regardless, still needs to be diagnosed in a hospital. We can see all the signs and symptoms of a concussion, but it actually may be a contusion. We could see all the signs and symptoms of a contusion, and it may be just a concussion. And I don't want anyone out there to think that a concussion or a contusion is necessarily the best injury to get to your brain, because ideally, you should have no injury to the brain. But that is obviously a case for better safety equipment and changes in sports and all of that good stuff. So. Understand, concussion, brain swelling. Contusion, brain being pushed on because of bleeding. All right, here we go. The big difference here is that with a contusion, we'll have pressure that's exerted on the brain as a result of blood that's building up between the brain and the cranium. Moving forward. Traumatic brain injuries can be found in simple cases of con concussions or contusions, but it can also be due to direct or indirect forces that are exerted on the brain, such as lacerations or hematomas. And again, hematomas are just like a contusion. However, it is a more significant bleed because it involves a vein or uh, hopefully not, but possibly an artery. Hematomas are much different because they typically don't exist on the outside of the brain. They're typically only found in the gray matter, in the dura matter itself. So we'll have subdural, epidural, or intracerebral, which would be in between uh, different aspects of the brain, where this bleeding is occurring. And that bleeding is causing there to be buildups of pressure. And so we'll start to see there is significant neurological deficit. So as you can see here, we have a quick diagram of different kinds of intracerebral hematomas and their different locations. Do make a quick note here that depending on where that hematoma is actually um, forming up, that will definitively affect the type of overall symptoms that we're going to see. And while it is not in the uh, policies or, or really procedures of the EMT or paramedics to make any kind of a diagnosis, 
the the presence of neurological deficits with any type of suspected head injury should make you believe oh this may actually be bleeding that's occurring inside of the brain and because we don't have any way to definitively show where that's occurring we need to keep our uh our assessments uh in, in the conservative range the conservative range being we want to do what's best for the patient we have very limited tools for assessment and we need to understand that the early recognition transport and treatment of those things will cause our patients to benefit a hundred percent more often than playing the fast and loose well we don't really know so we're we're just going to take you to a regular hospital the longer that they're out of definitive care because remember not every hospital is created the same we have specialty centers and where a certain uh, patient may benefit from going to a stroke neurological center or a center that would specify specialize and specifically look for patients that are having neurological injury they may also be, be more more benefit uh, or get more benefit out of going to a trauma center so understanding what your county provides and what each hospital has the capability of performing will in in most cases uh, help your determination of where to go but remember, a lot of agencies utilize base hospital contact. So if you are doing a really, really stellar job of explaining what you're seeing and what you're finding, you'll be more, you'll be a more well-rounded EMT and you will provide, you know, largely more effective responses in your communities. So patient care for any kind of brain or uh, head or cranial injury. We need to always take our standard precautions and have a high suspicion of possibility of spinal injury. When in doubt, C-spine. Open and maintain that airway. And remember, if we're thinking C-spine, uh, if we need to open and maintain the airway, this is the time when we want to utilize a modified jaw thrust as opposed to a head tilt chin lift. Uh, monitor unconscious patients for changing in airway or breathing. If we are going down the road of spinal injury, make sure that we do a quick head to toe assessment before we apply that cervical collar. And the reason why we want to do that quick head to toe is because once the cervical collar is in place, it shouldn't be taken off or adjusted unless it is starting to cause the patient uh, to desaturate, meaning that it's too tight around the um, it's too tight around the aspects of the front of the neck so we're cutting off carotid blood flow or if it's becoming uncomfortable to the point that we feel it would benefit the patient to loosen and readjust but that c collar really shouldn't come off until we have a doctor making that order we also need to control bleeding try to keep our patient at rest and provide emotional support we're also going to do our standard work dress and bandage all open wounds stabilize uh, any type of penetrating objects manage the patient for shock monitor for vomiting and prepare for suction if that is the case transport as quickly as possible and make sure that we are monitoring vital signs every five minutes intracranial pressure that is developing for whatever reason again will start to uh, lead to neurological deficits and these neurological deficits will be anything from confusion lethargy or, or becoming more tired um, some type of uh, aspect of there being reduced motor function or really anything that would lead us to believe that the brain is being negatively affected neurological deficits are pretty obvious to uh, to most people and it's anytime that your patient starts to act differently or abnormally from before and we have a whole laundry list of different neurological dysfunctions that we're going to get into some of the things that we're going to be looking for to determine if our patient is showing signs and symptoms of intracranial pressure will be pretty closely related to your standard vital signs but it's going to be differentiations from the baseline to what we determine later on as well as initial impressions of breathing and overall blood pressure so just as a review our very first set of vitals is called the baseline the second set of vitals that we take will help confirm or uh, tell us that we uh, were incorrect in our attempt and then the third as long as we are seeing that the numbers are either staying the same or are gradually changing in a in a uniform method 
then we establish a trend. So what we're looking for are trending symptoms. One of the most common trending symptoms that we'll be looking for to determine intracranial pressure or neurologic dysfunction will be something known as the Cushing reflex, or more specifically with uh, three different items, Cushing's triad. So Cushing's reflex is pretty easy because it only takes blood pressure and heart rate into, a con into consideration. So to determine Cushing's reflex, we're looking for blood pressure that is going slightly higher and a, an inverse effect with the heart rate. The heart rate's starting to fall. Cushing's triad, on the other hand, is where we add the respiratory rate. So what we'll see with Cushing's triad will be three things. We're going to end up seeing a blood pressure that is gradually changing, and we'll see that there is systolic widening. What is systolic widening? Well, it's that top number, and we're going to start to see that that's going uh, in another direction. So we'll see it go from 120 to 130 to 140, 150, whatever the case may be. The heart rate will still be the same in, in the sense that it will be slowing down, and the respirations will typically be deep and rapid, usually over 25 reps per minute. It'll be fairly obvious that the patient is taking very odd looking breaths. Another very common symptom is altered mental status. And that mental status will typically only get worse. It won't really get better. So we'll start to see that they'll have difficulty answering questions. They may be slower to answer questions. They may be confused or they may become more and more unresponsive over time. And we're also going to be looking at the pupils. Dilated pupils and or sluggish uh, reacting pupils or non-reactive pupils would be a very obvious sign of increased intracranial pressure. Now this next slide is gonna be going over very, very difficult to master concepts. So I want to urge you to get out your notepad and start taking notes. It's super important that you understand what we're talking about here. So let's jump into the most in-depth aspects of intracranial pressure recognition. Some symptoms that we want to be looking out for are going to be as a result of delayed reaction, reduced oxygen availability, and because of changes in the brain's perception of breathing. So the very first one we're going to talk about is called Shane Stokes breathing. Shane Stokes breathing is a cyclical, and by that I mean it runs in cycles, style of breathing. It is really characterized by deep, fast respirations that are followed by a decrease or an absence in respirations. And typically the cycle lasts anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes. So you're gonna see a patient taking very, very deep, fast reps, or very, very deep, fast breaths, I should say, not reps, because that's respirations. But they're taking very deep and fast, fast breaths followed by a decrease or an absence of breathing. The next that we're gonna be talking about is central neurogenic hyperventilation. Central neuro, uh, neurogenic hyperventilation is characterized by deep rapid breaths that are at a rate that's greater than 25 breaths per minute. It looks very similar to Shane Stokes, but the difference is that Shane Stokes runs in cycles, whereas central neurogenic hyperventilation is just increased respirations. And it should stay anywhere from 25 to above. And really once we start to get around the 40s and 50s, that those respirations will be almost completely without merit. There won't be anything that's actually being uh, changed. We won't be bringing in enough oxygen at the same time that we won't be, um, we won't be able to uh, off gas enough of that carbon dioxide. So we're not having that gaseous exchange like we've talked about in the past. The next that we're the next uh, sign or symptom that we're going to be looking at is ataxic respirations. Now, ataxic respirations will be irregular breathing that doesn't really follow a pattern. It may be fast and slow. It may be slow then fast. It may be fast then slow then uh, goes completely absent. But really, ataxic respirations are going to be completely without form or function. They don't fall within Shane Stokes or central neurologic hyperventilation, or I'm sorry, central neurogenic hyperventilation. Now it's important to understand something here. As the EMT, it is not your job to determine what type of breathing is occurring. What you should recognize is that if you believe your patient has a neurologic dysfunction, that there's something wrong with their brain and their breathing looks irregular or it doesn't look quite right, 
you're probably seeing the neurological deficits that are being caused by that injury. The next thing that I want to talk about is decorticate and decerebate posturing. Decorticate and decerebate posturing is important to understand because it will be present in trauma in very uh, different ways and it should mean different things to us. So what you need to understand about decorticate and decerebate posturing is what the words actually mean. Decorticate posturing is where the hands and feet, typically the extremities themselves, will be turned in towards the body. And what we typically see is that the hands are starting to, um, they, they, they almost start to look like they are cramping up. And that's typically what they're doing. You'll see the hands form almost a duckbill shape and they will turn in towards themselves. Think of a, uh, you know, think of a shrinky dink in, in reverse where you've got, you, you've got your little shrinky dink toy, you pour water on it and it expands. Well, this is the opposite. It's going in reverse. Decorticate can, is easy to remember because it, uh, it actually states in the word where the body's turning. Decorticate towards the core, towards the core, decorticate. It's all right there. Decorticate posturing is something that we can see in trauma, but we can also see it in medical emergencies. And we'll see it especially in cases of hyperventilation, hyperventilation. They're breathing too fast. It almost looks like the patient is starting to cramp up and you'll hear patients that will complain of pins and needles or tingling in their fingers and hands and feet when they are breathing too fast. Basically what the problem is, is again with gas exchange, bringing on a lot of oxygen, not off gassing enough CO2. It gets more in depth than that, but basically what you need to know is that decorticate posturing is one of the more common symptoms of both intracranial hemorrhage as well as issues with breathing, specifically with breathing too fast. Decorticate posturing should be in immediately noted and we should try to remind ourselves that the problem is at a molecular level. It is at a uh, very small level. So prying their hands apart, not going to help. Pushing their arms down, not going to help. This is not the same as a muscle cramp. It's very, very different. It has to do with gas and the way that gases are exchanged. On the other hand, we have decerebate posturing. Now, decerebate posturing is the exact opposite of decorticate. Decerebate will be away from the core. And what we'll see is a patient with their hands and feet, arms and legs, almost splayed out. And I know what you're thinking. I don't know what splayed is, Johnson. Well, don't worry. It's basically looking like the patient is starting to extend themselves in a way that is completely abnormal. Once you've seen decerebate and decorticate posturing, it's not something that you will likely forget because it looks so very obviously different than the way that we're normally going to position ourselves. Decerebate posturing is much less common than decorticate posturing. And decerebate posturing is almost always going to be an indication that we are dealing with someone with increased intracranial pressure that is significant enough that it is pushing on the nerves and the motor functions of the brain and the spinal column so that they are pushing outwards. In my time in the field, I've only seen decerebate posturing a very few times, and it's always been in significant multi-system trauma. And to the best of my knowledge, none of those patients survived. It is an indicator that the amount of pressure that's being exerted on the brain is immense. And you need to understand that decerebate posturing is something that you will typically only see in trauma. As of the time that I'm recording this, I don't have any medical conditions that would cause decerebate posturing, but I won't rule it out simply because the brain is something that's very sensitive to things that are not normal to its uh, everyday life, the way that it normally likes to be. Okay. And then finally, understand that these symptoms, they may be rapid in their onset. They may be very slow in their onset, but regardless of what happens, intracranial pressure needs to be noted because that will tell us that the patient is significantly impaired and that we need to get them to a place where they can get appropriate care. Whew, that was a long slide. Sorry, guys. I told you it was important. I hope you took lots of notes. Here we go. Now, think about this while you're doing your assessment. Does your patient have a serious or potentially serious head injury? And should they be transported to a trauma center? Again, follow your agency's recommendations, follow their policies and protocols, use your scope of practice. Also, does your patient's complaint and mechanism of injury indicate spinal stabilization? Or should we, uh, should we go ahead and modify? So we'll be talking about that in just a little bit so that you guys can have a better understanding of what both of those terms actually means. 
Now, with cranial injuries, we've always talked about how it's important to stabilize and secure impaled objects. And it is the same here, understanding that the only time that we're ever going to remove any kind of an impaled object is if it is immediately getting in the way of the patient's airway, meaning that it is a complete occlusion, so there's no air that's going through, or it's interfering with our ability to do chest compressions, okay? Now, especially with these cranial injuries with impaled objects, we want to make sure that we utilize the, the, uh, the tools and equipment that we have. And truthfully, if we need to cut something down to size, we'll typically not have the right tools to do that. That's when it's a good opportunity for us to get fire or our equivalent rescue agency out to assist so that we can make that happen. Now, moving forward, injuries to the face and jaw, the primary concern obviously is going to be the airway. When it's possible, we want to make sure that we uh, not only allow for the patient to have drainage occur from their mouth, but we also want to put them in a position where we can, uh, where we can aggressively uh, deal with impending airway issues, including suction and positive pressure ventilation through a bag valve mask. So we always want to have our patient rotated in a position where we can see the airway. A lot of the signs that a brain event that has occurred may not be as obvious as clear trauma to the head, neck, or back. It may be something medical, like a hemorrhage or a brain clot. The patient may be having a stroke. But remember that regardless of traumatic injury or medical, the evidence of these things will manifest through neurologic dysfunction, confusion, changes in vital signs, and the way that they are breathing especially, as well as positioning, okay? Remember that trauma and mechanism of injury are certainly difficult in some cases to really determine, especially if the event was unwitnessed. As the provider, if you can say, well, you know, I can't really rule it out, then we should treat the patient as if they have been, ex they have had some type of traumatic event. Because the worst thing that we can do is m skip over that trauma protocol and go straight to medical protocol and then miss an injury that could actually make them worse. GCS, Glasgow Coma Scale, one of the most commonly utilized neurological assessments, both in the field and in the hospital environment. GCS and AVPU, or alert, verbal, painful, unresponsive, are very handy for us to get a better idea of the level of consciousness of our patient. Glasgow Coma Scale can be broken down into three categories, eye opening, verbal response, and motor function or motor response. Each individual segment has points that are allotted. The total score for GCS is 15. The least score that someone could, uh, that someone could get is three. So this is one of those uh, tools where everyone gets a score. The least that you can score on GCS is a three or th one, one, one one on eye opening, one on verbal response, one on motor function, and all of those would be unresponsive or no response at all. The most that we could get is 15, and that's four, five, and six. And in the past, they have moved verbal response and motor response to different segments. So older providers may say four, six, five, whereas newer providers may only say four, five, six. But as an EMT, you're really not expected to uh, reiterate that GCS score out loud and do that uh, that type of uh, that type of calculation off the top of your head because it really doesn't change what you can and can't do. It changes a little bit more when we get into ALS and obviously once we get into the hospital. But as an EMT, it doesn't change what you do. If your patient is altered, uh, at least around here, your patient is ALS. So let's break this down. Eye opening, that is worth four points. It's very easy to do. Are they opening their eyes? Are they opening their eyes to a uh, painful response? Are they only opening their eyes to verbal response? Sorry, are they opening their eyes to verbal? Are they opening their eyes to painful or are they not opening their eyes at all? And it goes four, three, two, one. Verbal response is going to be based on your patient's ability to converse with you. A full score of five would be if they are oriented, if they can tell you who they are, where they are, what's going on and what time it is, person, place, time, and event. If they can't get all those four questions right, they are confused, which means that they can only get a total of four points. 
Then we have inappropriate and incomprehensible words. Inappropriate would be anything from not the right answer to, uh, you know, clearly a uh, delayed response to the question you asked before. And then incomprehensible would be, would be making basic noises or only moaning uh, instead of talking. And then finally, we have no response at all, which is all the way down at one. Finally, we have motor response, and this is where we get that final six points. A full score of six would be someone that obeys commands. We say, lift your right arm, they lift their right arm. We say, lift your right leg, they lift their right leg. Next, we have localizes pain. So this is the patient that if we give them a command, they will either respond by saying no, or this is a patient that we can only really get a response out of if we apply painful stimuli. And remember, we're not trying to hurt our patient, but if we, if we were to perform a trap, a trapezius pinch, or a sternal rub, that's the only thing that makes them actually move and respond. Next, we have withdrawal. And withdrawal is going to be someone that they don't respond by batting our hands away. They simply turn in, go into the fetal position, and they stop moving. That's going to be a lower level. And then below that, we have, uh, we have posturing. This is where we get back into decorticate and decerebate posturing. Decorticate is the next one. So they are, in, they are turned in towards the core. Decerebit means that they are splayed out away from the rest of the body. And then finally, we have no motor response at all, which is the lowest score of one. We shouldn't spend really any time at the scene trying to calculate the GCS, especially since all of our PCRs will automatically generate that based on our answers. Or if you're using a paper PCR, you can simply circle your answers and do the quick math. But remember, all patients that get a GCS, they will score at least a three or at the most 15. If somehow your score is less than three or more than 15, you done messed up on the math. You got to go back and do it again. Wounds to the neck. Oof, we talked about this the other day. Let's go into a little bit more depth on wounds to the neck. Wounds to the neck will often involve either the airway, arteries, or veins. Really, we're concerned about airway and circulation and eventually breathing. So this is an ABCs issue. Pressure in these veins and in these arteries are obviously going to be higher than they would in other parts of the body, which means that any type of laceration or even a small incision will create significant amounts of blood loss in a very short period of time. There is a, also a greater possibility of air embolus being sucked through, which could create a pulmonary embolism or it could cause there to be other issues further along down the bloodstream. To treat this patient, we need to stop the bleeding and we need to use an occlusive dressing to help prevent air embolism. So ensure that the airway is open, place your gloved hand over the wound if you don't have a, an occlusive dressing ready right away, and then apply that occlusive dressing. After that, we need to apply a sterile dressing over the occlusive and then apply pressure to stop bleeding. And it's important to remember, Pressure on this area can cut off arterial blood flow to the brain, so it should be enough pressure to stop bleeding, but not so much pressure that we stop arterial blood flow. Also, we want to make sure that we also understand that the arterial blood flow is on both sides of the trachea, so if we are only compressing one side, we'll have more available, available oxygenated blood flow to the brain than if we were to compress both sides, which we truly should not ever be doing. Also, we need to bandage the dressing in place and ensure that bleeding has stopped. This is one of those rare cases where, you know, you are very limited on the amount of pressure that you can apply, and this is not an appropriate place for a tourniquet. I know that that seems silly to bring up, but if you start placing a tourniquet on your patient's uh, neck, that's it's going to be the end of the day for you. You're not going to be working with that patient anymore, and you probably won't be working as an EMT for much longer after that. Also, try to immobilize the spine uh, regardless, I only say this because if they had some type of penetrating wound to the neck, then there is most likely going to be the possibility of cervical involvement. So it's a good idea to place that C collar in place. Or if it doesn't make sense because you're still doing bleeding control, reduce and, and restrict movement by patting both sides of the head with rolled up pillows and perhaps consider uh, double backing some duct tape and taping their head down so that they can't move because the majority of that movement is going to end up causing there to be further soft tissue damage and further bleeding. Injuries to the spine. 
With injuries to the spine, it's important to remember that the cervical spine is going to be the aspect of that body system that we can protect the best. We have a very specific tool for that. That's our C collar or cervical collars. And it also protects a very fragile aspect of the spine, which is the uh, the, the closest aspect to the, to the brain itself. So this will empirically control more life and death aspects of the actual spinal column and what it does. So it's important to remember that if we are assuming spinal injury, the best tool that we have and the very first thing that we should apply is manual cervical stabilization, uh, followed up with some type of device, either a cervical collar or complete immobilization to maintain the integrity of the spine itself. The spinal cord itself is susceptible to injury and because it is so integral to the way that our body does everything every day, we need to have a very high suspicion for cervical injuries if we're dealing with high velocity or high probability events of traumatic injury. So some of the mechanisms of spinal injury are pretty clear. Diving injuries, impacts with the windshield or whiplash, but there are others that aren't nearly as clear like a ground level fall or perhaps a patient that was involved in some type of injury that relates to penetration, uh, penetrating injury of the neck or the back. So some things to think about and especially where I teach we deal with a lot of not diving injuries, but a lot of injuries that are sustained in the, they're sustained in the surf. We call it over the falls where a patient is pulled from the top of the wave and then slammed head first into the sand. We, we deal with this call a lot. Uh, we're in a coastal area and we, we hear this call go out over the radio starting in spring and going all the way through to usually October or November because we have a very late summer season. But these diving injuries and these beach related injuries, we have to treat them with very high suspicion, especially because it is often, it is often associated with one or more complications, alcohol and drugs, unconsciousness or unresponsiveness or drowning or near drowning. These situations will require that we take cervical spinal in injury precautions based on the fact that we don't have a lot of information or our information is bad, okay? So some things that we need to take care of. Uh, there are potentially devastating consequences to missing a spinal injury. So when in doubt, go ahead and put them in full spinal precautions. Also, remember that the mechanism of injury or the physical condition of the patient may not tell the whole story. So again, as the EMT, as the trained professional, if it is in your if it is in your mind that this is a possible spinal injury, document everything, show your work, and by show your work, I mean tell us why you think that, and go ahead and follow through. High risk spinal injuries, fall from greater than one meter or three feet, or greater than five stairs. Now, depending on where you work, this number changes. Uh, I've seen anywhere from falls that are greater than 15 feet for adults, or two to three times the height of a child. I've seen as low as uh, here, three to five feet, or down a certain number of steps. Know what your agency says and follow through with that because they're gonna be the determining factor on is this patient high risk or not. Also, things like axial loading, like in diving or over the, over the falls injuries, or in high-speed motor vehicle crashes, especially when we're dealing with rollover, ejection, or obvious signs of deformity to the vehicle itself. If there's spider webbing on the windshield and we can tell that our patient's head struck the windshield, or if there's deformity of the steering wheel and we can see that there's an injury pattern that is uh, consistent with them striking the, the actual steering wheel, we need to go ahead and treat them as if they have a confirmed spinal injury. So again, mechanism of injury is huge to go ahead and take into consideration. Also, the kind of energies that we see where it will pull the neck or spine beyond its range of normal motion, like whiplash or rotational injuries, those are a big consideration as well. And then of course, our patients that have certain medical conditions, whether it be kyphosis or some type of spinal stenosis, any kind of an issue where the spine itself is not healthy, especially in consideration to the forces that effectively have been exerted upon that spinal cord.
Some other high risk things that we will tend to see are motorized recreational vehicles like ATVs and motorcycles, uh, bicycle collisions, auto versus pedestrian, any kind of a motorcycle accident where the rider has left the bike or laid the bike down. And again, your agency is going to tell you exactly what is high suspicion versus low suspicion. So be sure to review, update, and follow through with those because if you bring a patient in, especially as a BLS crew to a trauma center, you need to explain why you're doing it. By that same token, if you take the patient to the wrong hospital, you're simply delaying care. They're going to need to be transferred later and that is significantly altering the chain of events that could, you know, in theory, make the patient better or worse. So moving forward. Your physical assessment is very simple when it comes to the spinal column. And we've talked about this in patient assessment for both trauma and medical patients. But remember, thinking of the spinal column as a pathway or really as a set of stairs, we can do a very methodical assessment by, and I'm air quoting here, walking the spine with our fingers and looking for what are called step-offs. A step-offs would be where you would have to leave the path because the path is no longer there or the path is kind of messed up. So some things to look for, any kind of uh, deformity, any kind of abject tenderness, any kind of bruising or significant, or really any swelling or anywhere that the pain is so significant you can barely touch. Also, we, not, we really don't want to uh, focus simply on, on uh, things like paralysis, but that would be a pretty good indicator that there's spinal involvement, even if there's no pain. If the pain is showing new paralysis that was not there previously, and there's no signs of actual injury to the spinal column, we should still consider it to be high risk, and we need to put them in spinal immobilization. Also, changes in neurological function, pain with or without movement, tenderness, impaired breathing, priapism in males, loss of bowel or bladder control, deformity, and neurogenic shock. And I do want to put in a quick note here, loss of bowel or bladder control is a very good indicator that that patient was unconscious. And I would say that even if they did not have a seizure, there was a loss of brain activity that was so significant that the body lost its ability to hold in waste. That should be a very significant finding. And it's something that is overlooked routinely, not because we are bad providers, but because we are focused on the big picture and we're not realizing that the patient has urinated or defecated on themselves. So, and typically we miss urination, defecation. It's a little hard to miss, but urination, I can't tell you how many times we have mistakenly thought, oh, that's water that the patient had poured on them or it's sweat because it's not obvious. Dark clothing or a very small amount of urine is very easy to miss. So be sure to do the strip and flip. We have to get the clothes off these patients. Geriatric note, make sure that you know patients will often in the geriatric group have undiagnosed spinal or um, bone injuries because of the relative brittle nature of their bones. It's just a, it's a fact of getting older. Our bones start to lose density. Falls are therefore much more significant for our geriatric populations. Please do not overlook that. Also, remember that with patient care, we want to make them comfortable. We've moved away from this aspect of using backboards to take care of all of our patients, and we're really moving into what's known as spinal motion restriction, but we'll, we'll get there. If your treatment is causing the patient more pain than they were in before we moved them, and that pain is constant, we are not making things better. We are not in a position where more pain equals better care. More pain, equals more hemodynamically unstable patient, which equals patients that crash and get worse over time. All right, off my soapbox, back to patient care. Provide manual inline stabilization, assess their ABCs, and do a head to toe assessment, definitely applying a rigid cervical collar when it is appropriate. And especially on these trauma patients, you have to remember, we need to do a full head to toe assessment and having manual stabilization in place is the best way to do that because once the collar is in place, if you don't remember, I'm going to refresh you, we should not be taking that off unless it needs to be adjusted or if it has become so 
so much of a burden that it's actually causing the ABCs to be impacted, okay? We want to assess for sensory and motor function through CMS or circulation motor function sensation. We also need to apply the appropriate spinal immobilization device and then reassess those CMS things that we talked about earlier. Appropriate spinal immobilization really will depend on where you go. Back in the day, it used to be C, uh, C collar, backboard, straps, and a headbed for everyone. Now it's different. So let's talk about it. Spinal care has moved away from backboards for every patient that gets a collar. It used to be if they get a collar, you're putting them on a backboard. That's just the way that it goes. You didn't really go into the you really didn't go into the ER with a patient that had a cervical collar on without a backboard because that would almost immediately initiate calls for, hey, what are you guys doing? Why are you doing it this way? Okay? We have found that Spinal, spinal immobilization using a backboard, a head, a, a head restraint device, straps, and a seat collar can cause hypoxia, shock, hypoglycemia, pressure-related injuries, as well as general generalized breakdown of their hemodynamic stability, meaning that their vital signs just kind of end up tanking. They don't get better. Plus, you're going to have them on the board saying, I'm uncomfortable, I'm in pain the whole time. Again, if we're causing more pain to our patient with our treatment, 99% of the time, we're actually wrong. Okay, so moving forward. Spinal motion restriction, or SMR, is one of the newest tools that we have in our toolbox. So understand this. The spine is anatomically curved. Backboards are flat, rigid, non-conforming. Those two things do not go together. If you'll recall, if we are going to splint an injury, we need to... Yes, we need to pad the voids. We can't pad the voids on a backboard. We're going to end up putting undue pressure on those spinal components. It's just like saying, oh, hey, the patient's having back pain. We should put lumbar pressure on. It's not the same as driving around in your car. If we're putting undue pressure on the aspect of the spine that is actually injured, we will cause further damage. Therefore, we have come up with the idea and the uh, procedure of spinal motion restriction. Now, spinal motion restriction, de it, it definitely differs from state to state, from county to county, you know, even from department to department. But this is the main bit that you need to know. Spinal motion restriction starts with manual restriction of head movement by placing yours or your partner's hands on either side of the patient's head. The next step is placing an appropriately sized collar on the patient. Those two things don't change. This is where different departments, different cities, counties, and states get all over the place. Some departments will say that you need to use another immobilization device. It doesn't necessarily need to be a backboard. It can be a KED, which is the Kendrick's extrication device. It can be a short board, which is the, uh, very, the very broken down, simplified version of a KED. You can utilize a breakaway flat. You can use a Stokes basket. You can use a scoop stretcher. You can even use a folding, scooping backboard. But at the end of the day, they say you must use another immobilization device. Where I work, or where I have worked in the past and here locally, spinal motion restriction, especially on patients that are already ambulatory, they're already walking around, is, hey, come here. I'm going to put a seat collar on you. Go ahead and take a seat on my gurney. Try not to move. That is the way that we exercise spinal motion restriction here where I teach. However, that may not be effective for where you go. So know what the difference is. It's super, super important. Next, we want to make sure that the backboard itself is used more often as a transportation vehicle as opposed to where the patient stays. So backboards, rigid backboards do have a place. We use them for uh, transferring patients. We use them for patients that are in cardiac arrest. We also use them for patients that need to be uh, restrained, not because of spinal injury, but because of injury to the lower legs or, the, or to the hips. However, we rarely use immobilization devices like rigid backboards for suspected spinal injuries because, again, I'm going to double back here, putting a patient on a rigid non-conforming backboard when their spine is curved is completely in defiance of what we understand as medical professionals, okay? Uh, there, there are some other devices like vacuum mattresses, 
um, that may be utilized, but they're very expensive and they're very niche and they're brand new. So you're not gonna really see very many of them. I have yet to see them in the field and I've only seen them in demonstrations. And while they seem like a great idea, they're very, very new. They're still in their relative infancy. Uh, and even though they are very close to our vacuum splints, it is asking a totally different set of circumstances to take the entirety of the patient's body weight versus the weight of an arm or a leg. Now, with these rigid devices, we can also use them to get patients out of vehicles, to get them out of uh, very tight quarters, even to get them down you know, sets of stairs. I'd be lying if I said I hadn't used a backboard for larger patients as uh, you know, very nearly a sled using ropes and pulleys. But the spinal immobilization devices, as they have been used in the past, even in my career, are much outside of, you know, largely outside of what we're going to be doing on a regular basis for these patients with spinal or suspected spinal. As you can see here, these providers are applying manual stabilization of the head while applying a rigid cervical collar. This is a very common move. You can see that one provider is in the back seat while the other provider is in the front. They're measuring the size of the neck to the actual uh, collar and then they are locking everything in place which I can show you in one of our skills videos and your instructor if you're not in my class should show you at some point in class. Patients that have been subject to spinal injuries can be found in all sorts of positions and in all sorts of locations. Make sure that your cervical collar is in place before we move them if possible but also remember that any kind of movement that we do should be very minimal and should minimize the amount of pressure that is being exerted either vertically or horizontally. So pulling a patient by their arms or legs is putting some type of stress on the spine and we're actually causing more damage. That's why we never pull them up or down the backboard. We utilize what's known as a Z-track move, which my students have certainly seen and I would recommend you look for uh, on your own because I won't be uh, putting up a video for that. For peds, remember we need to use a right size collar and the right size device to get them uh, secured. If we don't have the right size collar, we can use a rolled towel that uh, keeps their head in place. And we also rem want to remember that the patient that is an infant, if we hyperextend their head in any way, which we shouldn't when we are uh, stabilizing their cervical spine, it can cause the airway to become occluded and closed. Now, seated Motion restriction is something that can be done utilizing a shortboard or a KED. We also have other devices, but those are the most common and those are the ones that we'll be talking about today. With low priority patients, we can take the time to put a shortboard or vest immobilization device on and we can go ahead and utilize the uh, skills videos that are linked below to, to do that. Those are for patients that are not in immediate danger. They're not going into respiratory or cardiac arrest. They're not bleeding to death. The vehicle is not moving, the vehicle is not on fire, the patient is not in immediate danger. High priority changes things. If we can, we wanna to try to maintain manual stabilization while we move the patient, but if it's an immediate danger to, uh, to ourselves, our patient, and the other providers, we're just gonna go ahead and get them out. And everything else can be uh, kind of thrown to the wind because moving them out as quickly as possible will save all of our lives. The best extrication style device is known as a KED and it has a very specific sequence to follow. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to breeze through these real quick because the videos linked below and in my Google Classroom are much more effective at teaching the procedure for applying these devices. It's important to understand that the only way to really do this effectively is through practice and you shouldn't be doing this for the first time on a live patient. Now, like I said, we're cruising through all these because the video will do a much better job. And what you can see here is the application of the Kendrick extrication device or KED. This is a very common device. And depending on where you work, you've either used it a lot or like where I work, I've used it maybe four or five times ever on real patients. And the rest of it was in training or during some type of a drill. Now with the long backboard, that is also a procedure that takes time, practice and communication through all providers. So I'm going to go ahead and put those videos up below so that you can see what that looks like. And they're also in my Google Classroom. When we're dealing with pediatric patients, we do wanna remember that a little bit of padding below their shoulders is going to be more effective than securing their head with some type of a device. And again, that has to do with closing the airway. 
It's important to remember that any time that we're dealing with patients under that age of six, that we can actually close their airway off by, uh, by not padding appropriately. And practice is the best way to prepare. Now, remember this, helmets, safety seats, safety devices, once they have incurred significant impact, they're technically no longer good. That's why I always say, remove your patient's helmets, remove your patient's pads, take your patient out of their safety seat. That is not going to protect them any longer. We need to get them in a new device that is not damaged by high, by high impact or by high energy level being exerted upon it. Also, the concepts behind uh, dealing with patients that are standing and placing them on a backboard are a bit outdated only because most departments utilize the, if they're standing and talking and walking, we can go ahead and have them walk to our gurney or bring our gurney to them, manually stabilize their head and neck, and then apply a C-collar either before or after they sit down on the gurney or lay down on the gurney. But the standing patient uh, or the standing takedown is something that we still teach. And again, I'll have a video on that so you can see what that looks like. And you can see it requires more than two providers to do that. You can see that they are effectively positioning the patient, holding the C-collar and holding the board, and then slowly lowering the board down degrees at a time and laying it down. Again, just like I said before, with helmets and, and uh, safety seats or safety devices, helmets really do need to come off. I, I would caution anyone that is going to keep the patient's helmet on to understand the physiology of what you're doing. Patients wearing helmets are going to be abnormally positioned with a large amount of distance between their shoulder blades, the back of their head, and the back of the helmet. Unless the patient is seated upright, there is almost no way to safely apply normal stabilization techniques with a patient who is wearing a helmet. That's just something for you to think about, but I, I won't really get on anyone's case about it for the simple fact that every agency is a little bit different. Uh, so according to the textbook, we should leave helmets in place when they fit snugly, when there's uh, absolutely no impending airway or breathing issues, if removal would cause further injury. And remember, at some point, the helmet is going to have to come off. Proper spinal immobilization can be done with the helmet in place, which, as I've said before, is impossible. And there's no interference with the ENT's ability to assess airway or breathing, which unless they are wearing a brain bucket or an open style face helmet where we can remove the jaw protection component is very difficult or impossible. We should remove the helmet if it interferes with our ability to assess and manage the airway. It's improperly fitted. It interferes with immobilization, which again, it will do 100% of the time or if the patient is in cardiac arrest. All right, we're here. Long video, but we finally got to the chapter review. Let's do it. The two main divisions of the nervous system are the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, known as the CNS and PNS. We should maintain a high index of suspicion for head or spinal injury anytime there is relevant mechanism of injury, or if we have a high suspicion of injury based on the relative, uh, the relative patient position and the amount of energy that was exerted upon them. Basically what we're saying, use your best judgment. You must provide cervical spinal motion restriction or SMR before beginning any other patient care if you suspect head or spinal injury. Altered mental status is an early and important indicator of head injury. We need to monitor and document our patient's mental status throughout the call. Traumatic brain injuries are injuries that disrupt function of the brain and may include anything from a slight concussion to a severe hematoma. Also, we always secure the torso to the backboard before the head, but in review, uh, that doesn't really uh, apply today because we didn't go over the individual aspects of spinal immobilization, so please do check out those videos. The key components of the nervous system are the brain and the spinal cord. They regulate thought, sensation, motor function. The skull, the vertebrae, and CSF, or cerebrospinal fluid, efficiently protect the brain and spinal cord. Closed injuries uh, is where the skull remains intact. However, 
open will be distracting and may lead us away from other things that are affecting the patient. Basically, head injuries can be very difficult for us to assess. So have a very high suspicion in the presence of a head injury of some type of spinal immobilization issues or if there's some type of an issue with mentation. So they're confused, they're showing Shane Stokes respirations or any of those other things. Neck wounds are at high risk for massive bleeding and air entry, which could cause an air emboli. Spines are often injured by compression or excessive flexion, extension, rotation, diving from compression and motor vehicle collisions. These injuries can interrupt nervous system control of body functions and can be difficult for the provider to effectively manage if they don't have additional support. Inline immobilization of the 33 spinal bones is essential to spinal injury immobilization. However, we need to follow our local agency equivalent to what they say we should do for spinal immobilization. Specific procedures apply to different immobilization and extrication techniques. EMTs must be proficient in handling the basics of these procedures, as well as understanding the devices that are provided by their agency and how and when they should be utilized. Some questions to consider when you're doing your patient assessment. Does your patient have a mechanism of injury that would indicate the need for spinal immobilization? Also, does your patient have the potential for head or spinal injuries that require prompt transport to a trauma center? And what does your local agency state is the actual parameters for them to be taken to those facilities? Here we go, final slide, ladies and gentlemen. You are treating a patient with a head injury. They are showing signs of altered mental status and they have a significant mechanism of injury to the head. Your patient says you should hyperventilate. When should you hyperventilate? What are the signs and symptoms that you would that would indicate you that this is necessary? Go ahead and answer in the comments below. If you're in my class, be sure to take a look at this because it's going to be a weekly question and we'll talk very soon. Thank you very much for stopping by. Again, this is chapter 30 out of the Limmer Emergency Care Textbook, 13th edition. I'm your man, the Band-Aid Man, OC Eric Johnson, signing off. Thank you very much for stopping by. Have a great day. Goodbye.